Good morning. Morning. Now, what a what a great song service we've had this morning, and we've we've. I, from what it sounds like up here, it's sounding wonderful. I'll just tell you, Chris, I agree. It's, it was Amen. sounding really good this morning. Y'all, I have, uh, this past week, I have been wrangling so many thoughts that have just been going everywhere. And I, I've wrestled this week uh, with what to talk about and, and where to go. And as, as I... As I wrestled, it, it was like, and, and I thought about it, it was like one, one thing kept rising to the top. One thought kept rising to the top. And it's a, it's a familiar narrative that we've seen many, many times. But we're going to go there today and talk about a few things, and it's Jonah. So I want you to go ahead and, and turn to the book of Jonah. comes right after Obadiah, if that helps. It's not somewhere we go really often. But we're going to be in Jonah. And I just want to look at a couple of things from Jonah. And then we're going to kind of branch out in a couple of other, other places if we have time. But as we look at this account, I'm going to read a couple of verses and then we'll start from there. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now just think about that for a moment. He's got a directive. He's got an order. Okay, it's not just a... It's not just a thought. This is an order from God. He says, I want you to go down to Nineveh, that great city, a very wicked, horrible city. If you know anything about the history of Nineveh, it was one of the most brutal um, city kingdoms that there was. And so Jonah is supposed to go down there, but instead he, he says he goes to flee from the presence of the Lord. Now just think about that phrase for a minute. And as you think about this phrase, flee from the presence of the Lord, think about Psalm 139. You remember in Psalm 139, David says, where can I go that you are not there? Where can I flee from your presence? When in the morning when I get up, you're there. In the night when I lay down, you're there. If I go to the heights, you're there. If I go to the depths, you're there. You knew me when I was formed in my mother's womb. You know my thoughts. You know everything about me. When I lie down, when I rise, in the darkness, in the light, it doesn't matter, Lord. You are there. I cannot get away from your presence. Amen. Now, for some of us, that can be very encouraging. For some others, it might be disturbing, depending on what your approach is to life and your attitude to know that wherever you are, you are in the presence of God. And so Jonah, in his brilliance, for some reason, thinks that God is not in Tarshish. Now, I don't know what, is, what was on his mind here exactly, thinking that he could do that. But anyway, so Jonah decides he's not going to follow God's order. He's going to go to Tarshish. And then, as you know, the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea. There was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken. And in verse 5, it says, Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God. That phrase, that, it just... And I'm, I'm, I'm going to back up just a minute and tell you what happened here. I was wrangling all week with these thoughts. And then I think it was Friday night, I sat in and watched The Finest Hours. Has anybody seen The Finest Hours? It's a movie that Disney produced. It was about a Coast Guard rescue of a, of a, a tanker back in 1952. It's an excellent, excellent film if you want to watch it. But I, when I was seeing these sailors on this tanker, and it, man, I'd already been thinking about this anyway, but I was seeing these sailors on this tanker. I was like, okay, God just sent me the, the, the this is what you got to talk about right here. It kind of, kind of lifted that right out, of the, right out of the pack. It says, the mariners were afraid and every man cried out to his God. And then they threw cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone down below and was asleep. 
And I, I'm reminded when I think about this particular scene that all these guys here, they are crying out at, you know, the phrase to his God. And in, in the New King James Version, it's a small g, which is it should be. And I'm reminded of the scene on Mount Carmel when Elijah is there and the prophets of Baal are, are calling out to Baal, you know, send down some fire. And they're hooting and hollering and jumping and screaming and cutting themselves and acting like fools. And nothing ever happens because they were crying out to a small G God. And small G gods are not going to help us, y'all. The big G God is the only one who's going to make a difference. So we have these small G gods that these mariners are crying out to and nothing happens. And so the captain comes to Jonah and says, what do you mean sleeping down here? Can't you see we're about to die? And you're just down here asleep. He says, so arise and look at this. Call on your God. That's for the big G. And perhaps your God will consider us that we may not perish. And isn't that the way with so many people? I'm going to try everything else. I'm going to go down every avenue I can before I admit to and accept that there is a big G God that is in control of this. I'm going to try my own things first. I'm going to go my own way and, and try to find my own solutions when the real reality is that the big G God is the solution to the problem. And yet here they are, and they're saying now, arise and call on your God that he may consider us and we would not perish. So they cast lots. The lot fell on Jonah. And they said to him, please tell us for whose cause is this trouble on us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And Jonah says, I am a Hebrew. And I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. And the men were exceedingly afraid and said, Why have you done this? It says, For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. I find that to be a very odd little statement right there. The men knew he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he told them. Now, I don't know what it looked like. It says, Jonah went down and found the boat going to Tarshish and and paid the fare and said, how much is it going to cost me to get to Tarshish? Okay, cool, I got that. Here you go. By the way, I'm Jonah. I'm fleeing from the presence of the Lord. I'll just let you know what's going on. I mean, I don't know how that worked out. But they knew what was going on. And yet they accepted him because, remember now, these are the same men who were crying out earlier to their little G-God. So they didn't really have a connection to or a relationship with or faith in the God, the Creator. So... It didn't mean much to him at this time. And so the men were suffering because of what Jonah had done. Look at verse 12. Jonah says, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for, for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Now I have read this chapter of Jonah I, don't, I can't tell you how many times I've read through this but this week when I read that statement I know this tempest is because of me I thought wow that's, that's the message that God wanted me to hear this week I know that my actions and I know that the way I responded to God have now put you in harm's way. That's what, just what Jonah's saying to these guys. And so I was thinking, how, how many times have we done something? Listen now, because this, this hurts my heart to, to think about this. How many times have we done something contrary to what God wanted and we caused a tempest for someone else? Just, you know, it, it happens. I do something that I, that I knew better than to do. And not only trouble for me, but trouble for other people as well. I can look back on a, on a time in my life when I'm, you know, many times. When I allowed a tempest to arise in someone else's life because of something that I had done. 
And it hurts to think about that. I, there, there was a, a, in high school, y'all, I was, we were out riding around one night being punk kids. You know, I'm just going to tell you, we were being punk kids. And one of the kids I was with, okay, I did not do it. Okay, it was not me that did it. But he broke the window of one of our high school teachers. And it, it, was, it was the group I was in, but I didn't know. And y'all, I have, I have struggled with that moment forever. Because I didn't go and say, look, I didn't do it, but I know who did. I'm not going to tell you who it was, but I'll pay for it because I was a part of the group. I, and I, 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 feel, I still feel guilt because of that. Because my actions caused a tempest for this teacher who had absolutely nothing to do with what was going on. And so during the middle of the night, her front window gets broken, and I can imagine what it must have felt like in the middle of the night to hear your window break. And so Jonah, Jonah says, I know, I know that you are suffering because of me. Yeah, I'm just going to tell you, if we are showing the love to the world like Jesus wants to show the love, the world is not going to suffer because of us. We are not going to put people around us in danger if we are living the life we need to live. Now, we might not always say things they want to hear because sometimes the truth is hard to hear. But if we are following God's plan and doing what God asks us to do, we are not going to create tempests for people around us. So nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land. But they couldn't, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. And in verse 14, everything turns around and says, Therefore, they cried out to the Lord. You know, isn't that something? That, I've, been, I've been calling out to my own useless God for a while, but I know now there is a God who is the big G God, who is the Lord. I'm going to cry out to Him now. And He says, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life. And do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked Jonah up, and they threw him into the sea, and immediately the sea was calm. And in verse 16, it says, The men feared the Lord exceedingly. They offered a sacrifice and took a vow. Now, I don't know what the vow was. I don't know what they said. I don't know what their, 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 words, their words were not important. But otherwise, we'd know what they are. The important thing is, they prayed to God, they offered a sacrifice, and they took a vow. Y'all, we've prayed to God. We've offered a sacrifice. God has offered a sacrifice, and we've taken a vow. So any tempest that comes along, God has already taken care of. Any problem that arises, God has a solution for it. God has a solution before we ever know there is a problem. Amen. That is a wonderful thing for us. Now, chapter 2 of Jonah is his prayer. It's his realization of his wrongdoing. Chapter 3 is his preaching in Nineveh when he goes through. And lo and behold, this evil city, this horrible place, they repent. And isn't that what God wanted to begin with? So then in verse 10 of chapter 3, this is, then God saw their works and they turned from their evil way. And God relented from his, his disaster that he had said he would bring on them. And he did not do it, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he became angry. <laughs> oh my says in verse 5, And so Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. Then he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. You know, I, I, I picture him, you know, I'm, I'm just going to watch what God does. I'm going to walk up here. I'm going to sit on the hill overlooking the city. I'm just going to, I'm going to see what God does. And then he was angry because God relented and didn't destroy the city. I'm just going to tell you, folks, I'm just going to be honest. There are some people in the 
public forum right now that if I found out that God was going to destroy them, I'd build a shelter and watch. Isn't that terrible? But there are some, there are some people who are so, who are so frustrating and irritating. And you can pick, you can put whoever's name you want to in that list for you. I don't care who you, who you pick. But that is not, I mean, I would rather say, God, no, give them what they deserve. Not, not, their, not your mercy. Give them what they deserve, God. Don't, don't relent. Destroy them. And then I think, but now don't give me what I deserve. That's a different story there. Because sometimes don't we, don't we revel in it when people get what they deserve? We do sometimes. I'm going to tell you, we were driving out here from Texas. I mean, I told you all this, but it is a great story. I'm going to tell it again. We were driving out here from Texas. And we were coming across from northern Arizona. And it was like windy, curvy road. There were eight cars in a line. And the speed limit was about 60, I think. And the lead car was going right about 60. And we were like sixth in line. And it was just slow enough to be irritating, but just fast enough where you couldn't go around them, you know. So anyway, there's this white sports car behind us in the very back of the line. And you see him pop out every once in a while. You know, we kind of see if he get a place to pass. Well, if there was a spot as long as this room, he'd shoot around somebody. Well, this went on for several miles until he finally got around everybody. And I told Laura, I said, you know what, that just irritates me so bad to see somebody doing that and acting that way. Finally, he got around the last car and he was gone. Out of sight in no time. So we drove along for another few minutes and we topped the hill and way down in these long straight stretch, way down in the distance, I saw blue lights flashing. And as we got closer, I saw it was a white sports car. And as we, as we drove by, the seven of us who were still in line drove by. And this white sports car was sitting there on the side of the road getting a welcome note to Arizona. And I was, it was so rewarding. <laughs> it was like, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Hey, you got what you deserve. Well, in that particular case, he did get what he deserved. I'm just going to tell you. Y'all, Jonah had this approach. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go up here, I'm going to sit, and I'm going to watch and see if these people get what they deserve. And you know, they had, they had heard the word of the Lord and they had repented and God relented so they got what they deserved. Because folks, I'm going to tell you, I do not want what I deserve. I, I want that mercy and that grace. Amen. I want the forgiveness. I, I want God to relent from his punishment. I, and I want him to be merciful and not just. Amen. So Jonah, bless his heart. First off, he didn't want to go. Tried to hide. Caused a mess for the sailors. Finally got thrown to the sea, spent three days in the belly of the great fish. Then he got vomited out on dry land. Finally went to Nineveh, did his preaching. Everybody was, was okay, and Jonah got mad over it, of all the crazy things. Okay, so that's the tale of one prophet. I've got about four minutes to give you prophet number two. That's all it's going to take. So we're going to go over there. I'm going to get you prophet number two right quick. So this is going to be a tale of two prophets, basically. Prophet number two, Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah chapter six, verse one, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne and lifted high up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew and one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of Him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. And so I said, Woe is me, for I am undone. 
I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Can you imagine what this scene looked like? Can you imagine being in the presence of the Most High God and there's angels flying around crying out, Holy, Holy, Holy! And you realize you don't deserve to be there. And now I'm in trouble because here I am. And then one of them flew and he took a, took a hot coal and put it on Isaiah's lips. And he says, Your iniquity has been taken away. And then he heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who am I going to send? Who will go for us? You see, God didn't look at Isaiah and say, I want you to go. I'm going to send you. You're the person I'm asking to go. He just said, who am I going to send? (laughs) And Isaiah like, send me. I'll go. I'll be the one. Can you see the difference in these two guys? God says to Jonah, I want you to go. And he goes, I don't want to go. And God says, I need somebody to go. And Isaiah says, I'm your man. Let me be the one. I'll do it. I told you that Isaiah wouldn't take long. That's all we're going to do for Isaiah. Man, what a, what, what, a, what a difference in two people. Here's what I expect you to do. I'm not doing it. I need somebody to do it. I'm your man. Y'all, we need to be Isaiah's. We need to be, I'm ready, God, to do whatever, realizing not because of my holiness or my goodness, but because of your holiness and your goodness, I'm capable, I'm able, and above all, God, I am willing to do whatever you ask me to do. As opposed to, hmm... I don't think so. And then if I do get the results you're looking for, I'm going to be mad. Now we look at these two guys and we look at the events of their, of these two accounts. Jonah tried to hide. He caused trouble for people other than himself. Angry at God's results. Or someone who says, God, I'm, I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. It, we look at these two and think, how, how could two prophets of God be so different? Well, the same way we're different. Y'all, I'm going to tell you, we have some folks that are like, God, God I'm, I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. And there are folks who say, well, I don't really know if I want to or not. That's just who we are. And I don't mean just here. I mean as then God's entire kingdom is filled with people like that. I want to be like an Isaiah. I want us to be like an Isaiah. That God, no matter what, I will do whatever you ask. No questions asked. Just call on me. Let me be the one. Pick me. Pick me. Do you, do you want to be picked by God? I mean, we are picked by God. We are chosen. We are His own special people. We are His chosen generation. We are picked by Him. Are we willing now to submit to Him and do what He wants us to do? And be the light of the world. To be the salt of the earth. To be the example to the world that needs to see Jesus living in us. And we may be the only Jesus they ever see. And so we got to make sure they see the Jesus they need to see. So that's what I want to encourage us to do. Is be the Isaiah who says, here I am, God. Send me. Encourage each other. Take courage in the Spirit and the guidance of the Spirit. Take courage in prayer. Take courage in your relationship with God and with his body to be that person. Not just today, not just tomorrow, but all the time. If you need encouragement, y'all, why don't you come while we stand and sing?